I'm Steve Lochran. Um, I'm from Horton Works. This is actually some work I was doing in my spare time before it, before I joined Horton Works. Now, I am, I'm a Hadoop developer, but I'm not one of the experts in this conference. I also don't know that much about Groovy. So you can ask me hard questions about either, and I'll get them wrong. What I'm hoping to do is show some of you who know a bit of Hadoop how to make your life better by embracing Groovy as part of your coding. As part of this, there is now a little mini library up on GitHub called Grumpy, which is to make life easier. There's not much to it because actually integration between Groovy and Java is so trivial. But you can download it and you can see all the examples that I'll be doing today. So first question, what is Groovy? I like to view it as kind of Java++. plus plus. They've fixed some of the things that have been left out of Java, like maps, lists, tuples, closures. They've also stolen bits from Ruby and Python, some of the syntax, some of the concepts. They've also thrown away some bits, and that can really hurt you. But the point is, is it, it runs in the JVM, but it lets you do things that Java would never let you do before. It also integrates really well. In particular, you can subclass Java classes. Java classes can subclass you. So here is, is a mapper it's, I mean, that runs inside Hadoop. It just says, I'm going to extend the normal Java mapper class. And my map operation just does what you do. So it looks almost like a normal mapper, except I'm using the keyword def rather than defining what my data types are and letting Groovy work it out for itself. Nothing exciting there. Where things do get exciting is actually in the reducer, where there's a little line in the middle, which is actually quite interesting. It's where I go from my, my data to reduce to match actual answer. So we'll zoom in on that one. This single line goes through a list. It takes a list in there, the values operation. One little operation says collect, which means for all the things in the list, do something for it. The something is that little stuff in angle brackets, which is a closure. It's a little lump of Java of Groovy code that's going to run. That code takes the implicit variable it and just extracts the value. Then at the end of that operation, at the end of the collect, I call a sum operation, which is a thing built into Groovy stuck onto lists that says, take this list and add up all the values. So in that single bit of statement, I have gone through a list, added up all, got the actual values of all of it, and then added them all up which, and this is amusing, is a map and reduce all on its own. There's a map from whatever the value is to an integer, and then a reduce where you take all those integers and go them down to a map. So I'm implementing my reduce as a map and reduce in Groovy. What does this mean? What can you do? Well, one of the data sets I've been playing with is three years worth of detect discovered Bluetooth devices in a city in Britain. University stuck up about six different scanning ports and scan for Bluetooth devices they could see. And we have 10 gigabytes worth of data like this that has a location, a hashed MAC address, MAC address timestamp, and the users and any name they've given it. So overall, I've got 100, 163 million events in that data set, which I can now process. In fact, even adding up the numbers was step one. But that's not enough, because if you look at that code, you see, hang on a minute, the same device is being seen about every 20 seconds because it's being scanned and dropped out and scanned and dropped out. So you have to clean the data up. How are you going to do that? Well, what I want to do is say, if I have seen the same data 30 seconds earlier, then we merge it into another event. And that's actually kind of hard to do in normal map reduce because events are independent. So the conventional way to do it would be saying, I do it in reduce phase. You'd say, Let's push out all the events from a single device. Then you reduce it. You have a reducer for every single device. You merge that in, and that gives you, and at the device time, you'd get that list of events. You'd have to reorder it for time, because it might come out in odd times, and then you can do the merging. That's bad, because you're, doing, you're shoving lots of data around, and you're doing, it, you're doing it reducer side. It's less efficient. So what I'm doing here is by the fact, if so I are doing a language like, say, pig or hive, that's what you'd have to do. It would be elegant, but inefficient. What I'm doing here is utterly wrong by the standards of MapReduce, but it's a very efficient kind of wrong. Because effectively what's happening in my map, I'm saying I'm getting my events coming in. And rather than emitting, normally you meant to transform it 
your map and then emit it straight away. What I'm doing is every event that comes in, I stick it into a window. I'm implementing a sliding window. So if the event goes into this window, and then I go through that window and I say, which events have now expired? Which events are more than a minute older than the event that's just gone in? And I emit them. And at the end of the run, in the cleanup operation, I throw out everything else that's still in the window. So provided I'm taking in a data set that has all the devices in order, I'm emitting them later on, merged events that are being merged in during the insertion. They might come out in different order, but I've effectively done the debouncing in one go. And this makes it a lot easier to process lots of data. And as a result, I can then go in and start analyzing it in more interesting ways. And this is a very interesting graph here, what are some data. This is a year's worth of sightings of Bluetooth devices in this city. Notice how it goes up and down, up and down, up and down really regularly. Hands up, who knows why that is? Right, no, that's weekdays. So basically, it gets quieter at weekends. It blips up in the middle. And oddly enough, in this city, Tuesdays and Wednesdays are the big days. More than Mondays, more than Thursdays and Fridays. There's a really weird event later on in the year when suddenly August, the end of August, suddenly a lot more mobile devices popped up. We're not quite sure entirely why that is. iPhones hadn't come out then, but we have a suspicion that may be confirmed later on, because if you look later on, there is a massive blip at the end of the year. You've seen more devices on that December the 15th than any other day of the year. And what maybe, maybe, maybe that's actually Christmas shopping. People have run into town to buy all their Christmas presents. And the answer is no. No, that happened a week later. It turns out, when you look at other data sets you have in the area, like timetables and things, December the 15th was the end of term for the university. So that's all the students out having their parties and pub crawls, and their phones get seen more. So we could, it could well be that all those devices from August, the end of August onwards, suddenly saw a lot more devices because it was the students all coming to university and bringing new phones with them. So it'd be really nice to go and analyze all this data in more detail. I don't have the time to do it. The university won't share it, but it's really annoying. But I think it'd make a great data set for people to do good analysis on. Anyway, while I'm doing all this stuff, I'm doing Hadoop coding. And one of the things that annoys me is some of the Hadoop APIs are kind of painful to use. Actually, let's be precise. All the Hadoop APIs are kind of painful to use. But some of the things you use again and again, like the configuration objects, are extra painful because you use them all the time. And one of the features of Groovy that's quite nice is you can add new methods to existing classes. If you want to add new method to a Java class, you've got this subclass it, stick new method on. And then only if those existing subclasses are around can you work on them. Or you end up writing your helper methods in different classes and evoking them. Groovy says, no, you don't have to do that. You can make up new methods and stick them in existing classes. So this is what I did for the configuration. Because in Java, in Groovy, no, in Hadoop code, you're invariably reading configurations, writing configurations, calling configuration get in, configuration set, all that kind of stuff. Instead, I've injected three methods in here, something called set at that takes a key and a value and hands it off to the normal Hadoop set operation. Something called get at does the same thing, calls configuration get at. And the final one takes an entire list of values and just calls the set operation over them in sequence. And that makes my life significantly easier, because what it now does is it lets me use square bracket notation to read and write data in a configuration. So basically, I can take a conf, just quote up some value like map script, and assign it to something, and it's, it's assigned. Same for read. I can take that value. I can convert it back up. If I want to add more settings, I can just pass a map down. And that's, this is why Gro uh, Groovy is very much Java with improvements, is the way to view it. Now you've got lists. You can override operators. You can start passing map around. You can just make your life slightly easier. It's not having to learn a completely new language. It's more most of the things you knew in Java are valid. Now you can take them and say, I'm going to, run, I'm going to write Hadoop jobs in Groovy, but I will, I will make my life slightly easier for me than if I just did them in Java. So I can do this configuration. Now, if you look closely at that first operation, I'm not only taking advantage of the stuff I've stuck into Groovy, I'm actually taking advantage of extensions tricks that Groovy have done to existing Java APIs. 
So that's a Java file object I'm creating at the top, new file, I'm going to pass it a source name. And there is a new method injected by the Groovy team called text that returns the entire text contents of that file. So that top line there is actually reading in a complete text file of a path I've given it and sticking it into my configuration under the name map script. One line, very efficient, no hassle. So now I have in my configuration object a complete text file full of data. And the question is, what you can do with that? And that's where Groovy gets even more interesting because what would be in Java land a text file of data, there's a special word for that in Groovy. It's called script. Because Groovy isn't just a compile time language, you can actually compile any lump of text or string you find and actually convert it into a script instead you can invoke. You can not only do that, but you can actually tell the script compiler which base class to use when you compile that. So you can compile your script into a subclass of script that has a set of methods in there designed to make it easier to work with Hadoop. And because of that, there is now a feature that I added this morning which actually gets this working, which is that I can now actually execute scripts from my MapReduce job. So rather than actually writing my code in advance, compiling it down and then running it, with this stuff, all you do is you can take a text file for the map and reduce and have it compiled in, not compiled in, but handed off to the job and have it, the script compiled during the actual execution of the job itself. And this, to show you it's not rigged, I'm actually going to demonstrate. Here we have my IDE up there. This is the test for it. This isn't actually the right test. Let's find the right test. That's the Hadoop code itself. I've accidentally fallen into Hadoop. Yeah, this one here. Right, so here's my test. I have a little inline string that says this is my mapper test. And basically, this, the mapper now just imports three different Hadoop classes. The rest of the code in here is actually what will get run in my map. And it says I'm going to create a new value text and emit the value one. I'm just doing a line count here. I've got another script for my string for my reducer. It's this script here that says for my reducer, I'm going to just get the key and value that I'm going to merge, and I'm going to do that same sum operation we saw before and emit the value. So I'm just purely counting up the values. So to run that, I just pass the values in, and this is the combined map reduce, and I pass the values in using those array stuff and maps that I've shown before, and it will do the values. So let's just test that, shall we? As usual, as everyone said before, it is good to have a test data set, a small one that you can run your code on and see if it works. So let's do that. What nobody has mentioned is that your, your test data will invariably not contain the errors you will find in production. When I first did this data and shoved it, and I had all my tests were working, I was really happy, so I stuck it on the big data set and went away for half an hour. I have a very small cluster. I came back and find it crashed. And I had to add extra diagnostics and error handling and report problems and finally track down the problem. And the problem was there was a bug in my code that everyone who'd given their phone a name that began with a comma would crash my code. So the moral there is don't put, design your code to be paranoid. Anyway, so that's me. I've done my map and reduce job and I've counted the number of lines and it says somewhere there are 50,000 of them. Now, anyone who's been in talks before will say we assume that's actually a rigged demo. I'm going to show that's not the case by adding an error message to this string, some random text. And so now that's not going to, it's not going to work at runtime. It's not going to compile. So we go back to the map and reducer, run the same test again, and see what happens. It compiles. I'm using Maven. That was a mistake. So it maps. Maps all goes nice and happy. We're on to the maps, and we're going here, and we're going to get to the reducer. 100%, here comes the reducer, and well, that's interesting, it didn't fail. Okay, it is a rigged demo, sorry, I lied. Um, I don't know why that happened, actually, because I would expect it to fail horribly. But 
because what should be happening is that that gets compiled to compile time, and I've warned that one of the problems with approaches is, is that if your script is only parsed at once you get to reduce phase, it's not convenient if you spend 20 minutes doing a map and then your code crashes the moment you get to your reducer. So this stuff is all prototype. What I want to do is better pre-flight checking so even before you submit the job, it makes sure that your actual mapper and reducer work, at least to an extent. Let's get back to the presentation. So we've got script-driven stuff in there, and it's, it could be quite convenient. As the key thing is that I've just shown some examples of actually how you can use Groovy in Java. It's pretty, I mean, Groovy in Hadoop alongside Java. And it's convenient because you can subclass to Java. You can do what you want with it. You've got a high-level language for expressing things in Java. You can fix up things like the configuration object to make them more useful. And you can do new tricks like the dynamic compilation. The question is, should you actually do it? And I'm going to be ruthless here and say, if you can use a language like Pig, go for it. Don't waste your time doing something in between. Pig's a great language. It's got Illustrate. It does good stuff. Just do the high-level languages. The reason to use something like Groovy is because you either want to do stuff that abuses the system, like my sliding window debounce, or you want to do really low-level stuff, which is where I've been playing with it, is actually subclassing other bits of the Java code. In fact, I'm also in my part-time... Oh, I've stopped now, but I was trying to write a yarn, a MapReduce v2 application using Groovy as well, just to see that it could be done. So play with it. Big issues around Groovy are, if you're going to play with it, it's two warnings. One, performance. Pre-Java 7 is doing too many lookups of what's going on when it does method calls. It's always introspecting to find it, and that makes things slow. For Java 7 with Invoke Dynamic, it's believed it'll be faster if you have to do tests. For my data, it doesn't really matter as I'm IO bound, but for other projects, it's different. The other thing is, Groovy does a lot of things to try and help you by having overriding defaults. So you don't have to say if. You can, in an if clause, run things have true or false. If you pass in the reference, if that thing's null, it assumes it's false. So anything that's great, I'll use nullivera. But also, if you have a string that actually resolves to an empty string, that's false too. So you can write code that sometimes works, and you think you get really complacent, and then you find it doesn't work when you get a value that's an empty string, and you weren't expecting that. So you can get burned occasionally. So you just have to be cautious. I like it. I'm not using it full time, but what I have been doing is I've been using all my tests for it. And I've actually, last week, I've been writing some Swing client side GUIs in it as well. I know people are staring at that. Does anyone remember Swing? It's like web browsers, only it's on your machine. But actually, it's really good. So one of the things I've been trying to do is actually have a GUI for submitting jobs to a Hadoop cluster, where you just drop in the files you want and it submits them. Anyway, ongoing work, that is. So. That's me. I've been playing with Groovy. If you've got time, I think you should too. Now, do we have any questions? Okay, at first, thanks Steve Luguin from Hortonworks for his talk. Okay. Bertrand. Okay. Bertrand. The class that you showed to, uh, to compile the Groovy, that's called Script Compiler. Is that the standard Groovy class? Um, I think I subclassed a bit of it. OK, I could go to actually that code if you really want. Let's go back to scripted mapper. I call this little script compiler thing that, no, it does extra things. Go in here. The script parser, I create a compiler configuration. That is a standard bit of groovy stuff where you define various parameters to pass in, including the base class for the script itself. So it says compile it down for this base class. You pass in a binding of net key value pairs, which the script can then handle. You create a groovy shell that's standard, and then you parse it. That's all you have to do. Right. And uh, so, so the, base, the script inherits from the base class? Yeah, and the base class is called script operation, which is, it's got, it basically extends a script, it knows a bit about MapReduce, and that it, you pass an emit, pass in a key and value, and it writes it out. So it, it's a basic stub of things you would actually want to do, and the other one is incremental counter. So it's some basic, basic operations on Hadoop context. 
One of the things there is that Hadoop has a notion of a map context and a reduced context. Groovy doesn't care because you're calling methods by name and it'll work it out at runtime. It doesn't, it doesn't matter that the two types aren't, don't have a common base class. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. Then we have a coffee break, I think. Okay. And thanks. Thank